Okay, welcome to TV Set, uh, aiding and abetting the progressive community since 1991. And this is our special uh, pre-Christmas show. Um, our show is usually, and if not always, focusing on uh, helping people to realize the need for social change and to, uh, to take a look at some of the people that are actually working to affect so social change. And um, so this show is no exception. I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Gerritsen, and with my other co-host, Give them hell, Sally. Sally. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <coughs> you had to be here 15 minutes ago to Sally Steepath, please. Thank you. Please, please <laughs> forgive me, Do Doctor Sally Steepath. In fact, and uh, mm -hmm. we're going to be discussing Sally. Uh, Sally uh, found a wonderful uh, program that was on TV and suggested that we. Um, that we uh, design our show around around uh, some things that were said in this program. You want to go ahead and explain what you had in mind? Well, this program was really about income disparity. And, and it was Bill Moyers. It was Bill Moyers, and he was mm -hmm. interviewing uh, a financial uh, editor of Rolling Stone and also a journalist who just, Christia Freeland, who mm -hmm. just wrote a book called Plutocrats, where she interviewed all these, the top 1%. Mm -hmm. And whereas when, when we were doing the Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Portland, uh, that seemed to be acknowledged that there was this real disparity between the top 1% and the rest of us. But um, you're being polite. <laughs> yeah, but it really hasn't been <clears throat> talked about. No, we just haven't. It hasn't been mentioned ever since. It's taboo in our exactly. society. It's taboo to say that the top one percent mm -hmm. are making too much money. Yeah, and that you something know, needs and, to be done and about it. They are not ta not being taxed, etc. But in any case, so I brought it in and said maybe we should talk about it. But I think first of all we should talk about. Uh, the news this week and the fact yeah, that we just absolutely. had a service in uh, in Connecticut that the the mm -hmm. president was just there talking mm -hmm. about all these children who were who were, were killed. killed I mean there's nothing more to be said about that but mm -hmm. I just wanted to acknowledge it and maybe even take a minute it's mm -hmm. it's a it's just a horrific yes it, it's a horrific event where the most innocent of our society have been have been uh, forced to pay the ultimate price. Yes. And yep. it'll be probably months before we dig into the background of the perpetrator's psyche and find out why. I, w I would like to say <coughs> that I was listening to uh, a radio program that was dealing with this issue. And one of the reporters that was on this uh, radio program with a woman and she was saying that an event like this is completely senses, senseless. There's no use trying to understand it because there's nothing to understand. Exactly. And I think that's exactly wrong, because I think mm -hmm. that I think that we need to try and understand what happened and what were what are the forces that were at work mm -hmm. because this <coughs> the United States more than any country in the world has this kind of thing that is taking place uh, yes. with alarming frequency. Um, and, and the United States does not have the highest uh, level of gun ownership per capita in the world. Uh, Israel does. Israel? I think Canada has more guns in per capita than we do. They may, but I believe Israel is, is the highest. highest. And I think Sweden's way up there. Um, and Sweden, and, and there's another country, um, Switzerland. Okay, maybe it's, I'm sorry. Switzerland. It, well, it was Switzerland. I was thinking. Of. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> but in both of those countries, they don't have this kind of event that we're having here. So I think that we do need to try and understand it. I don't. I don't think that. I think it's an easy pass to say that this that this is a horror that goes beyond uh, understanding. I think we. It's our duty to try and understand this. I agree with that. However, I also am aware that we do not have some kind of understanding of that event right now because it was mm -hmm. just awful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
I think it, it's just enough for us to acknowledge it and to go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, as yet, no explanation of why this right. happens well, in this country. Yeah. Yeah. As to quote my famous line in Independence Day, that's not entirely accurate. Um, there was a guy, and I heard it on NPR, who wrote an article, and I think it was Mother Jones, where he talked about these issues. And he went back into the causes. Many of these people are mentally ill. Uh, they have, they were bullied by students. Uh, bullying was an extreme case, and most of them, uh, are or some of them are the result of poverty. So just to paint a broad brush and say we need to get rid of guns or have more stricter gun controls, I don't think we're going to deal with the issue. But if we begin to go back and give it some time and then go back and study this, go back and look at it, you're going to find bullying as a child in there and poverty right up there. And also We do not have answers now. Jeff, so I, I think we should just go well, we with have the answers. topic that we've right. prepared mm -hmm. that we have right. some ideas about instead of t discussing right. but this in depth because we don't have answers. But what I was going to get into, depth. yeah, for the, well, there are, this is from a previous ones, but this dovetails right into the income inequality issue. Of what we're going to play tonight's, tonight's show. show. Okay. Great, great save, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I was coming around there. <laughs> coming Very around the outside. Slowly. I know, i got to speed it up. Okay, so um, <coughs> so how, how should we do this? We, we, brought, uh, we, we have some, some clips to show you, uh, you folks that are watching, about the show. And by the mm -hmm. way, if, if you have a computer, you can watch the show in its entirety on a computer uh, at, at your leisure. All you got to do is go to Google and put in Bill Moyer's Plutocracy, and it'll take you to, mm -hmm. to YouTube where you, or to the uh, uh, PBS, PPS think, site, yeah. and then either, either one, uh, you can watch the whole thing uh, in, at, mm -hmm. in, in its entirety. All right, how shall we start? Uh, I think we should roll in with the first clip. Okay, uh, control room, thumbs up for clip number one, or no? Looks like they're working on it. Okay. Okay, we're going to show you Across clip the number earth one. Of this divide between the super rich and everyone else has become a yawning chasm, and studies indicate it may stifle jobs and growth for years to come. At no time in modern history has the top one hundredth of one percent owned more of our wealth or paid so low a tax rate. But in neither of the two presidential debates so far has the vastness of this astounding inequality gap been discussed. Not by Mitt Romney, who is the embodiment of the predatory world of financial capitalism, and not even by Barack Obama, whose party once fought for working men and women against the economic royalists. Income inequality has soared to the highest level since the Great Depression, with the top 1 percent taking 93 percent of the income earned in the first year after the recovery, the first full year after the recovery. Why are the two candidates not talking about inequality growing at breakneck speed? You know, I think because it is still a taboo in American political life and in American cultural life. One of the economists I talked to, he works for the World Bank, and he said to me, you know, and he's a specialist in income inequality, and he said, when you go to think tanks and you say you'd like to do a study about poverty, they say, that's fine, that's great, we're happy to fund it, because writing about poverty makes everybody feel good and feel that they're being charitable and beneficent. But if you say, actually, I want to study income inequality, and even most dangerously, I want to study what's happening at the very top of the distribution, what Branko Milanovic said to me is the think tanks immediately pull away because they say our donors won't like it. Mm. And that actually challenges the whole economic setup of the United States and of Western capitalism. It, it's very, very threatening. And I think that that's why you've had the billionaire class. You know, the minute Barack Obama, I would actually say rather gently yeah. suggested Extremely that gentle. the millionaires and the billionaires should pay a little bit more. You had immediate cries of class warfare from the plutocrats and, and, and very emotional. You know, there was an activist investor who sent an email to his friends. The subject line is, 
battered wives. And in the email, he compares himself and his fellow multimillionaires to battered wives who are being beaten by the president. He actually uses those words. And I thought it was really interesting in your book how you pointed out that Bill, Bill Clinton uh, himself uh, uh, responded to Obama's criticism by saying, you know, I would have done it a little bit differently. I think, um, you, you know, you, you can't attack these people for their success. And I, and I think that's very relevant because if you go back in time, it wasn't always this way, but I think the shift really began with Clinton and the new Democrats. I think after, you know, Walter Mondale lost in 1984, the Democrats decided, you know, we're never going to lose the funding battle again. And they began this sort of imperceptible shift where they, they continued to campaign on social issues the same way they had before. They retained their, their liberalism in that, in that sense. But economically, they began to side more and more with Wall Street and more and more with the very rich. And they've, I think we've now reached the point where neither party really represents the very poor uh, in the way that the Democrats may be used to. And so that there's, that, that's why you, know, you don't see it in the debates, because neither party is really an advocate for that kind of left behind class anymore. It, it is the people at the bottom, as Matt says, but it's also the people in the middle. Right. You know, the middle class is being Decimated. hammered. Those yeah. jobs are hollowed out. And where are the people pulling back and saying, okay, technology revolution, we love it. Globalization, I love that too. And I think it's great people are being raised up in India and China and now Africa. But let's think about how our society and our politics need to change to accommodate this. And no one is doing that. And meanwhile, the guys at the top who are making, who are doing so, so well, actually are saying, we need to slant the political system even, even more in our own even. favor. Why are we so passive about this? Well, I think the, first of all, uh, the, the poor in this country have been incredibly demoralized, uh, the, the, whether it's uh, the relentless attention of you know bill collectors, or if you go to poor neighborhoods, you know I was out in Queens last night interviewing a kid who who's been stopped and frisked 70 times already. He's 22 years old. You have this constant uh, interference by the police if you live in a bad neighborhood. Um, there are all these obstacles to to, to getting up and, and rising up and and having your own voice. And also, I think in the media, um, we get these relentless messages that being poor is actually your own fault. Uh, and that, that people who are rich deserve to be rich. Uh, and a lot of Americans are disillusioned about, uh, about their situation. They believe, they actually do believe on some level, that... Thanks for coming out of that one. <clears throat> okay, um, there's a couple things that I noticed in this, uh, in this piece here. And it was uh, um, the, the, <clears throat> the impact that, that money and that, that wealth is having on even being able to discuss this issue, as as mm -hmm. uh, as you were bringing up, um, that that the, uh, as uh, as uh, Christia or Christ Christia, I I don't know whether it's Christia or Christia. Definitely Miss Freeland, Freeland, but Miss mm -hmm. Freeland, yeah. Uh, as she as she uh, put very well in, in think think tanks, if you were to p propose a, s a study about poverty, they it would be a good thing. But if you wanted to propose a study about wealth and especially the people at the very mm -hmm. top end that wouldn't get funded because the donors are the people on the very top end and so they're squashing even any any thought about it from that very level so that, and uh, then again when she was talking about the Republicans and the Democrats and how much money there's uh, they have to raise and how the Democrats have had shifted over to uh, to position themselves yes. to be able to get more money from Wall Street and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Again, money is is squashing alternative, squashing debate. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like this self feeding loop. Absolutely, and money owns most of the most of the big media mm -hmm. in this country. Yeah, and since Citizens United, this has turned into almost a frenzy. Yes, it's I mean, a feeding it, frenzy, and. It's just millions of dollars are being Oh, well, now we're talking billions wasted. of dollars. Wasted billions, yes. Billions. Billions, on you're right. You know, I mean, within 10 years at this rate, we may have the first political presidential election that spends a trillion dollars just in the campaigning process. I mean, how, how insane oh, can that be? That, that's, that's like a, that's an order of uh, magnitude. several magnitudes. Well, maybe <laughs> not. You know, yeah. the Koch brothers certainly found out that, that 
throwing money at things doesn't win them the the election. They have yeah. to be more more uh, you know, yeah. more uh, more insidious than that. Yeah. But it's not just money. We all believe that we can make it. This country was built on people making it themselves. Mm -hmm. People, you know, coming up having pulling a themselves chance. up. Yeah. Having a fair mm -hmm. chance to having make a it. fair chance to make it. And the 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 but, but number of people who've done that in the last 20 to 30 years is minuscule. It's, it's fallen it's, off. It's fallen off. It's fallen off because the, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Is it time, and is it time for, your, for your, your chart there? That would be nice. Okay, yes. uh, control room. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a photograph that's on, uh, on our share. Uh, and it's, it starts off, it's called Inequality, I believe, and if, if it would be mm -hmm. possible to bring that photo up uh, so that we could take a look at it. I've got a picture of it here. I can sort of hold it up and, okay, I think we have the real thing. Go ahead and let's switch to the real thing if we have it. There we go. There go. Can we zoom in a little? Do we have zoomability? Okay, well, we, okay, okay we good. Go. We got, we okay, got okay, tell us about this thing, Sally. Well, we have two this charts. first one is the average household income before taxes, and the top 1% is that orange, uh -huh. red-orange line that goes and way up to the Netherlands, and almost to $2 million. And for, the for the folks that, that are at home and can't read the time scale, tell us what the years say across the The bottom. years are from 79 to 07. Okay. So it's not even it's or not even 20, current. But these are this is twenty oh seven. Yes. This is from the Congressional Budget Office. So this yeah. is five years out of date. Right. Mm -hmm. And already. this is pre Citizens United. Yeah, so it even goes up mm -hmm. higher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanna interject yeah. something right here that some of the folks at home, depending on the quality of your T V set, some folks uh, or who just watch the standard sets don't realize that there are two lines at the very bottom of the graph. It just looks like the base of the graph right. that don't go up at all. <laughs> right, and those are There's three the lines, actually. fourth 20% and, and the bottom 20%. And if, if you're watching this show on a standard TV, you may be in that group. <laughs> Actually, even that's the top 20 percent and 20 percent yes. is nothing in this country yeah. haven't gone up much yeah. Yeah. it's only that top one percent it's yeah. really gone these up. are the people that occupy wall street occupy portland occupy right. seattle so. occupy idaho right we're talking about right. those those are the people that are stealing their future and our future too yeah. and our, our children's future and in that clip we that we just talked about there was a couple things that were to me were appalling these plutocrats, as they call them, have skewed the system in, in their favor, and then they want even more. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you? I mean, yes. they want even more. Yes, um, they do. And also, when Matt answered, Matt Taibbi talked about why we're not responding. I felt that was so insightful because he talked about how we've been battered, we've been badgered as a as a middle and bottom classes, mm -hmm. and then. We've also bought into the idea that if we're poor, it's our fault. Uh -huh. And I think that roots, the root well, of that's that. that's Calvinism. That's precisely. You know, this country is built on Calvinism. Precisely. Yes. And also yes. that plays very well into an Ayn Rand philosophy. Yes, it does. Mm. Yeah. But anyways. I'm not comfortable with this. But I tell you what I am yeah. comfortable with. Fiori. Fiori, yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we have a Fiori for a little relaxation here? Okay. Yeah. Mark Fiore, by the way, did win a Pulitzer Prize surprise. for his work, and so we are very proud to be able to show some of his cartoons on our show. Yeah. Still waiting. Bravo. Pay attention. Yes, pay attention. And so it is. So. All right. Um, um, we have a second roll in. It would probably be Good. a timely, be timely, timely thing to, mm -hmm. to take a look at that. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we have an, uh, the second roll in, or the it's roll in number three that we'd like to show you. If I can get a thumbs up from the studio, we'll take a look at that. But um, 
But you both have pointed out that we tend to talk as if Wall Street and the plutocracy uh, were a monolith. But it's not. Do you think there is a, a civil war within the one percent? There is. There's absolutely a schism developing uh, in, in in this in this community. Think about it just on one level, on, on the level of banking, right? Uh, if you have these two big to fail banks. Everybody in the world knows that nobody's going to uh, allow the very biggest commercial banks to go out of business. It will never happen. 2008 proved it, that if they ever get in trouble, uh, the government will come in and rescue them. So what does that mean for those banks? It means that it, it allow, allows them to borrow money more cheaply uh, because uh, anybody who lends them money knows they're always going to get paid off. The government, if in the worst case scenario, they're going to get paid off. So this gives them an inherent financial advantage over the small regional commercial bank, which, which uh, does not have that implied government guarantee. Uh, and so those people are furious. They're furious that, that uh, they have to compete against these gigantic monoliths that have the implicit backing of the U.S. government. Then there's the other problem of corruption. And, and I hear all the time from hedge funds, uh, you know, these, these smaller guys who believe that some of the big investment banks are selling them out to even bigger hedge funds that are, that are you know, giving away information about their positions to even bigger clients so that somebody else can trade against them. Or the, maybe the banks themselves are front-running their positions and, and, and trading against their own clients. Um, there's this schism developing between the smaller guy, uh, the medium-sized uh, financial player, and the very, very big, too big to fail companies uh, that are perceived as getting a break uh, getting a, uh, and getting the backing of the government and, and also are perceived uh, as, as getting away with stuff uh, that they wouldn't get away with. I agree with Matt, and I think what you're really seeing actually it's sort of the battle of the millionaires versus the billionaires. Right. Because this winner-take-all yeah. dynamic uh, is not just between, you know, the 10% and the 90% or the 1% and the 99%. What's quite interesting and, and leads me to really believe that there are some deep economic forces involved is it's happening just as much within the top 1%. We saw it in the recovery. You cited those statistics, Bill, about 93% of the recovery going to the top 1%. 37% of the recovery went to the top 0.01%. So even in there, there's you know even more of a gap. And the people one layer down can be very, very aggrieved precisely because you know they see what's going on. They, they, they see that unfairness, and it makes them really, really mad. You know, one of the things that I found as I was writing my book and talking to plutocrats was, you know, as Matt says, these are very, very smart people, and many of them, not all, some they work are very hard too, don't they? This is not Downton Abbey. These are not <laughs> people, th this is not a landed gentry. These are people who, even, and, and even if they're sort of a Mitt Romney or a Bill Gates who grew up very affluent, their actual business, they did build themselves. They built in a society that was very supportive of that, but they built it. So, you know, they're hardworking. They have to be thoughtful about the world because they're making investments. And what I found was very interesting was they were very keen to divide the world into the good plutocrats and the bad plutocrats. And what was very funny was everyone was happy to make that division, but everyone felt that they themselves and their particular right. type of business belonged to good plutocrats and somebody else belonged to bad ones. So you talk to the Silicon Valley guys, they love talking about this, especially after the financial crisis, because their view was, of course income inequality is a problem, of course there has been state capture by those bad guys in New York. Right. We, however, <laughs> are the innovators. We created value ourselves. We are completely pure and good. And these issues really have nothing to do with us. Okay. So nobody's to blame, or nobody believes that they're to blame. Everybody believes that they've created their value. All of, you know, the top 1% think that they deserve all that money that they're making. Mm -hmm because they're working hard, you know. Um, but what about the guy down at the bottom or the gal down at the bottom who's working for minimum wage? They're working hard. Yes, they and are. And they get brushed and aside. And nobody's, nobody's looking at them because they do not have a voice uh -huh. in Washington. Yes. Okay, so so uh, so far in our discussion, because I'm, 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 I'm Continually thinking about what can we do, what, uh, you mm -hmm. know, 
Yeah. And so I'm just trying to keep, I don't want to talk about that yet, but I'm just trying to keep some things in mind. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that I saw was the power of money to dampen any discussion about about the problem mm -hmm. and to steer mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the um, our elected representatives away from the problem. And here we're seeing <coughs> that that the, the plutocrats that are at the top of this thing that are making, they are themselves the mechanics of this disparity, mm -hmm. yes. have no remorse whatsoever. In fact, they're Well, very they're envious of the top 0.001 percent have who more. have even more. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, you now what's happening now is the top 1 percent have become the same or become a microcosm of what's happening in the general yes. society. You're having a civil war within the ranks of the 1 percent. Yeah. There was, a, there was a figure that was, that was uh, mm -hmm. mentioned in there that I think is really worth repeating, and that was the, re the, the money for, for the recovery, our economic recovery, you know, Obama mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. recovery thing. Ninety-three percent of that economic recovery money went to the top one percent of our population, and it gets worse. Yes. Thirty-seven percent of all the money went to the top zero point zero one percent and they have the gall to say we deserve it right yes okay, right. I mean can I, I'm just sitting here aghast I want to call them my favorite term but you keep chastising me about that <laughs> so so I, I think what's significant here is that there's no remorse there's no, no there's, there's no, no self-control there's no their, their guidance system has been has been broken yes yes they, they have uh, they have no they have no concern for anybody mm -hmm. else other than themselves. And I think that's what Christia Freeland says in her book. Mm -hmm. She's talking, she's interviewing <laughs> these plutocrats, mm -hmm. these people who have so much money and have so much power, and she's really putting a face to it mm -hmm. and talking about who they really are. Yeah. In a previous time, didn't mm -hmm. we call these people the robber barons? Yes. And that has Certainly, lost, but that was before FDR, FDR. and he FD called them economic royalists, right? But that's lost its negative connotation. They now proudly say we are the robber barons, and I don't care. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I, I think so. I th you know, the, one of the things about th that I I think is so admirable about democracy is that when things go wrong, mm -hmm. the people should have it in their power to to write the ship of state to bring it mm -hmm. back on course. We saw that a little bit in the last election. The Republicans, I mean, did you see Karl Rove's meltdown on Fox News? Well, yeah. I didn't see it, but I heard of it, and I just like, that was music to my ears. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it's, it's on YouTube. It's, it'll be music to your eyes, too. Eyes. But yet they are, the, the people finally said, in the, in the midst of what, over 500 million, maybe close to a billion dollars, mm -hmm. and they couldn't get what they wanted? Yeah. So yeah, it's starting. In the, it's in the, well, I, and I hope it, it continues. Yeah. In the face of voter suppression, Christian. in the face of all yeah. those uh, amazing ads, uh -huh. the, the people did speak. And I hope that, I certainly hope that the people continue to speak, but mm -hmm. the deal is, if the political remedy, if, if the legal poli political remedy is broken, you know, mm -hmm. if that becomes broken, then we have, to, we have to consider what else is available to us. Well, I yeah. think the beginning of that political remedy is about, you know, the 99% is about the Occupy movement, is about listening to everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and and I think that just having had the Occupy and having been able to see the power mm -hmm. of getting together. They were such an inspiration mm -hmm. to me. They were. The one thing They that still are. They're still around mm -hmm. doing actions yeah. to stop income disparity, and to there's some, there's some stop cutbacks that, that cut the little guy mm -hmm. and leave the big guy, you know, with thousands. But the overall frame of the Occupy mm -hmm. was to reinstill the concept of empathy for your fellow man, mm -hmm. society, mm -hmm. and empathy 
for future generations. Mm -hmm. It's like I tell my people, or tell my friends, they all criticize me, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you spending all this time on TV set or whatever? Why aren't you out making money? I says, I'm concerned about not only the issues that I face, but what about my children? What about my grandchildren? Yes. And I'm trying to say, I'm trying to express that empathy out over time. And that's one thing that we just like, toss it aside. Who cares about empathy? I want my stuff, I want it now. Mm -hmm. Jeff, during the break, there was something that you said I, I think needs, uh, needs repeating, mm -hmm. that it almost seems as though we're heading into a, a, a new medieval era. Yes, yes. When we take a look at, at this kind of thing, when we, we take a look at how the, here we go. When we take a look yeah. at how the, um, mm -hmm. at how, how the, the, the wealthy are becoming so much more wealthy and how the, the, uh, the less wealthy are, their plight is, is getting worse. Well, and and uh, this, the change over here, you can see that the, uh -huh. that the, uh, and the prospects the for the people that are in the lower strata of society are getting worse. And, and that's a chart, but if you want to paint a word picture, okay. the eight errors of the Walmart uh, corporation mm -hmm. have more wealth than the bottom 30 and depending upon what study you want to use mm -hmm. to 40 percent of our country. Mm -hmm. Eight people mm -hmm. have more wealth than at least mm -hmm. the bottom 30 percent of this nation. Yeah I, I think we really I think I think power of the pocketbook is one of those kind of mm -hmm. things I think we need to be scrupulously careful mm -hmm. where we spend our money and what mm -hmm. we spend our money I on. I agree. Yeah. Because it's probably stronger than a vote by a long shot. Isn't it time for another uplifting? Another uplifting <laughs> theory. <laughs> these are these are really <laughs> heavy topics. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's what you we're here that for. That theory was uplifting. <laughs> this next one's even better. Oh, is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This one actually will be. Okay. okay. So uh, we have a fury in the form of uh, that should be rolling number four. Uh, somebody give me a thumbs up when it's time for the next one. Here we go. <laughs> and so yes. it was. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes. Uh, but I, I have to add something here. Okay. The, the root cause of everything we're talking about is all, all occurring in a larger frame of peak oil. Peak oil is basically dictating a, a, a progressively shrinking pie. Mm -hmm. So everybody starts scurrying to grab their piece. And you know. other resource depletion, peak yes. oil peak probably going to... It's not gonna, just well, peak oil, but yes. It's all, well, all the above. But, but peak oil probably be yeah. one of the first to rear its ugly head. Yeah, so I mean, it's, so what we're talking about here is in an era of uh, shrinking, a shrinking pie, right. how do we uh, equitably and egalitarian-wise make it comfortable for everybody? Do we buy into the wealthy have earned it so they can trash us like they did in the Middle, middle Ages? Medieval times, of course. They even, I think they had it better because at least they had the common areas of the forest that people could go in and meet their needs. Here, there's no more common. There's no, no such thing as the commons anymore. Mm -hmm. um, right. That's very true. But but mm -hmm. what we're what we're looking at is that the wealthy are still making more right. and more and more. You know, that mm -hmm. has not stopped. If anything, it's accelerated. Exactly. It's accelerated because of the, the Resource income depletion. inequality. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yes, we have less and less resource, but, but the wealthy is not, the wealthiest 1% are not seeing the fact that we have less and less, we, less and less, um, resources because we are still generating enough money for them mm -hmm. to increase their their wages. Well, they've rigged the system. Yes, they have. I mean, in this last go-round, nobody's gone to jail. That's right. Yes, we've seen record, we've seen record um, fines for corporations, yes. but that's just 
they just add that to the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people should have gone but, to jail. But it's yeah. not, the corporations are getting fines, but they're also getting enormous tax breaks oh. to, to move from one state to another, from one right. town in a state to another. There we go. That's people good. are competing for jobs, and there are businesses that go out there uh -huh. and and set these people up and say, listen, yes. you can get a better tax better. rate in X state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we just you had know. that. We mm -hmm. just had that here locally in in Portland. Yes. Nike came to yes. the mayor or mm -hmm. the state or whatever and said, um, if you renew that tax break, we'll hire 500 more people. Yes. And we're, we're going. Yes. Excuse Everybody's me? being held hostage mm -hmm. for jobs. Okay. We and you know, and people are making money off mm -hmm. of these bargains and these mm -hmm. deals. We have another rolling. Okay, we have okay. another rolling. Thank you. Sorry to throttle you there, Sally. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we have thumbs up. Here we go. And, that, and they also um, have built up uh, this very, very powerful insulating psychological justification uh, for, for their lifestyles. Um, they, they've adopted the sort of uh, Randian point of view where... Ayn Rand. Yeah, exactly. You know, they, they genuinely believe that they are the wealth creators and that they should get every uh, advantage and break, um, whereas everybody else is a parasite and, and they're living off of them. So when you bring up to them, for instance, how is it that, that nobody, uh, despite this mass epidemic of fraud that appears to have happened before the 2008 crash, how come nobody of consequence has gone to jail after that? Um, they always, you know, th they always argue against more regulation and more enforcement because they say we need room, to, we need air to breathe, we need room to create jobs, and this is just counterproductive to put people in jail. It'll, it'll, this, it'll if cast if a pall say, over Bill, society. This very sincere, absolutely, absolutely sincere self-justification, I think, is one of the most dangerous things that's happening because in our society, and I would say this is particularly powerful in America. Really, since the Reagan era, there has been this vision of the successful business person as really a leader for the whole society. And there has been a view that the business person, what he thinks, and by the way, all of my plutocrats are men, but you know, what he thinks about how society should be ordered, we should all listen to because he, after all, is the hero of our time, is the hero of our capitalist narrative. And I think it's so important for us to really understand that what is good for an individual business, particularly in this age of very high income inequality, and the, the ways of thinking, the ideas that are uh, no doubt absolutely the right ones for this particular business may very well not be good for society as a whole. Both of you write in different ways that, with irony, that they threaten the system that created them. Well, I, this, yeah. was, this was another thing, another image from Russia that always stuck in my mind. It'd be when, and, I, and I studied in Russia when it was still communist. I remember going through the, the countryside and you had all these villages and, and people walked around in the villages. And then suddenly in the mid, mid to late 90s in Russia, you drove through the Russian countryside and suddenly there were these big brick houses that had these huge walls on the outside, these big brick walls with, with guards on the outside. It was the rich had sort of built this wall that insulated them from the rest of society. Uh, they were li what, what there was one society on, on one side of those walls, and then one society on the other side of it. And I think that's where we're headed now. We have this kind of community of rich people who sort of live, hop from place to place, and they never have any uh, sort of intercourse with the rest of the world. Uh, disconnected. They're completely disconnected, and so they, they've they've built this kind of nation. Uh, where inside it, it's, it's all uh, you know, nice and everything works logically and, and it makes sense to them, but they never really see what, what goes on on the outside. Do they feel entitled? Yes, absolutely. And, you For know, what reason? Because they are treated so well. So <laughs> my favorite story about this was um, I was at Heathrow Airport about to go to a fancy conference and I ran into someone also going to the fancy conference, a Silicon Valley senior technology person. And, you know, I didn't have a car, but he had a car coming to pick him up, and so he offered to share the ride. So we're in the car. And this technology guy said to me, when you live our life, 
you are surrounded by such power and such entitlement, you lose touch with reality. And his very personal example was, he said, I was recently staying at this lovely Four Seasons Hotel, and I was beside the pool, I was eating a melon, and my spoon fell to the ground. And he said, before I could summon anyone, someone rushed up to me with three spoons of different sizes on a linen napkin, <laughs> so that God forbid, you know, I shouldn't have the wrong size spoon. And what he said was, you know, what was amazing to me, he's talking about himself, is when I re-entered my real life, he said, I was kind of a jerk because I, re like, I expected to live a life where I was constantly being presented with three spoons of different sizes. And I just, I couldn't deal with the frustrations of everyday life. What makes this a totally ironic story is here he's telling this kind of self-aware story about the plutocracy. But when we had been in the airport waiting for the car, he was on the phone screaming at someone um, about where is my car, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, you know, morning in Heathrow, middle of the night, you know, in San Francisco, and he's yelling at someone there because she hasn't organized his car and we had to wait for five minutes. And then he tells me this story about how entitlement can make you not an ideal person. That kind of says it all, right? Well, but political behavior is another thing, and there's no doubt in either of your minds is there that they tilt the rules in their favor through their influence and power over the politician. No, absolutely. I mean, just, I mean just our own government <coughs> relaxed the regulations, appended the rules, leveled the laws to make way for them. They have this power and influence uh, over, over the government to, uh, and they've been continually deregulating the atmosphere to, to legalize whatever it is that they want to do whether it's the mergers of uh, insurance companies, investment banks, and commercial banks. The derivatives, the, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000, they lobbied heavily to create a completely deregulated atmosphere for that, and we saw what happened with that in, in 2008 with the collapse of companies like AIG. Um, they've been incredibly successful in creating their own uh, landscape uh, uh, where they get to do business the way they want to do business. And, uh, and what I think is crucial is this is not for you need a t ten second black on the end of the roll in. Okay. Okay. Any comments on that one? Um. Well, I think it's illustrative of how we see the one percent and how they see themselves and the difference between those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I just was going to comment that um, they they never create the jobs they promise. Yeah, that's 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 a lie for them to further their agenda. There there are yeah. a number of lies in here, like like yes. what they're doing is good for the for the for the people as a whole. They they've never created the jobs they promised, and the question I want to bring up or the comment I want to bring up is, since when is a successful business person a model for democracy? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really. I so what you're successful in your business. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you would be successful at democracy. It certainly made me cringe, you know, when the, the Mitt, Ro Ro Mitt Romney thing was going on. Uh -huh. You know, uh, that that a uh, that that somebody that with business practices that he had under his belt would <laughs> actually consider <laughs> that a qualification for yeah. becoming president. And the other thing I noticed is, have you noticed that they're creating more and more of this armed fortress mentality? Mm-hmm. Matt Taibbi yes. talked about in Russia yeah. that they literally are creating armed fortresses. There's mm -hmm. a guy out there with an armed guard. Mm -hmm. And that's what I fear more than anything else because at some point when your backs are against the wall, you'll have a violent reaction. Well, the truth is despite uh, the armed fortress mentality, mm -hmm. they're at, at, they are separated. Yes. Mm -hmm. From the rest of us, they do not eat in the same places. That they do not talk with people who believe what I believe. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're okay. just not. Mm -hmm. They don't have a finger on the pulse. Okay, I I created a little or picked up a little video that talks about a way we can begin to rewrite the narrative and provide mm. some possible solutions. So what do you think if we go look at that and then come back and start looking at some options? Let's, let's okay. do it. Okay, uh, do we have that rolling? That would be number six.
So, <coughs> do you think he's suggesting that we learn to empathize with the uh, with the zero point zero one percent? I think he's suggesting that we empathize with the millions at the bottom. Is what he's who talking are being about, exploited? The sweatshop workers. Mm -hmm. The okay. Yes, the people who are being exploited. Okay, gotcha. All right. Yeah. So, but but in, but in fact, it was said tongue in cheek. So yeah, we don't really. That was dr dry British humor, wasn't it? That was dry British humor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what we gave away the five pence. <laughs> well, that too. But but in fact, here in in wet Portland, we mm -hmm. we right. don't always. But that's what look at dry British humor. Yeah, but that's what Occupy Portland did. That's what Occupy yes. Wall Street did. They tried to bring up that disparity yes. and they try to educate people and they were trying to show people that there are a lot of young people who are who have had their futures stolen mm -hmm. from them who are mm -hmm. not who are not happy they're yeah. very angry and they're mm -hmm. they're um <laughs> and i think i think that was uh that was the message there are a lot of yeah. angry people young this smart people. people this was the pro the process he <laughs> outlines was the same process that England or the UK use to ultimately bring about the end or abolition of slavery in the British Empire. The, the, I'm what? sorry? The process, the process of empathy. Of what? The process empathy? of empathy, the process of understanding what it's like, mm -hmm. what the slaves yes. went through. That yes. created a social movement and began to bring people says, you know, we we can't be doing this anymore. Well, that would definitely be the carrot, but I think we're going to mm -hmm. need a stick too. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we're how's our time now? Uh, about like thirty seconds, something like that. Okay, Any, you guys have anything you want to say before we roll quickly into the tunes? Well, I I just want to send people to Bill Moyer's journal and to see the full okay the full yeah. it's piece worth watching on it is, definitely the plutocrats. It is All worth right. watching. Roll them. Yes. Roll them tunes. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you after. I guess it's going to be this, uh, January it's 6th. Going to be January. January 6th at 6 o'clock instead of 7. So eat an early dinner before you watch us. Okay. Okay, so this first one is a, a cartoon about how um, in, Ga in Uganda they are locking up uh, gays in prisons. It's a prison offense now. And that's what this cartoon is supposed to indicate. I guess that's better than executing them. But not much. Not much? Not much. So this one uh, is uh, the USA going over, in this case, a, a fiscal waterfall. Oh. And Obama is saying, why can't we... We just need to get the wealthy people to share a little money, a, 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 little, a little of it, and, and Bain are saying no. So this one's from Jordan, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it says Mubarak as just these broken feet walking along like the Saddam's broken feet off from the statue, uh, indicating that uh, the Egyptians are not uh, happy with, with, the, with the new guy, Morsi. This one, uh, a little bit uh, dated, but it's... Uh, it's uh, Mitt Romney um, flipping the bird, and it says 47% on there. So he's giving the 47% the bird. Yeah, right. Canada's pretty astute. Yeah. This one from Austria is about the the the, uh, the shooting uh, event. Okay. And it says yeah. uh, and it says uh, like fathers like sons, and there's the father uh -huh. shooting away in over yes. one of the Afghanistan, Afghanistan, and there's Libya, a son blasting away in a school, which I think is. Probably, too. Yeah. No. Uh, this one from Holland, uh, it's uh, showing M M Marcy Pinocchio. being like a Pinocchio liar, oh, trampling freedom, democracy. Yeah, he said that we're just going to, yeah. he has all power now. And this one, it says, would you like to buy some, some eco-friendly energy efficient light bulbs? Light bulbs, yes. And, and it's indicating that even, even the eco alternatives are, are putting us deeper in the hole. Oh, yeah. This one from uh, Czech Republic, uh, showing lies uh, falling down from the sky and these people trying to protect themselves with newspaper. Must be from Wall Street. Uh, well, looks like Wall Street. It's, it's about freedom of the press. Yeah. 
and it says, but if working people had to, uh, had the same opportunity as the wealthy, what's the point of being rich? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, this one, another cartoon from Egypt, uh, indicating that Egypt is, is just uh, nothing more than a, an assembly line of pharaohs, one after another, these all-powerful potentates with no, yeah. no democratic hope at all. Mm. Yeah. Now, this is a wild one from Mexico. Um, who would think that a Mexican political cartoonist would draw something like this? But here it is, showing the intractable inner woven nature of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. All up in the guns in there, too. Yeah, and this one from Russia, showing uh, some guy trying to put some bank water on these houses so they'll grow nice and big, but the, the taps seems to be kind of dry there. They but nailed it pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, the banks are not lending money as yeah. usual. Right. Uh, this one from Greece, Greece is showing uh, ostriches in a circle. <laughs> uh, a, apparently, they will form the uh, European Union sort of thing, but they've all got their heads stuck in the ground. Yeah. So much for the euro. <sighs> well, um, this one from Mexico. Um, and, and it's, it's a takeoff on the little prince, but the little prince is a behemoth now, and it's about global uh, overweight. This one from Lebanon, Kim Jong Un's yep. missile launch. Mm -hmm. How, yeah. ir how irreverent. I know, and their country is starving. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Uh, this one from Egypt. Uh, showing um, uh, the Palestinians and, and then, but then uh, over on, a, on a, a piece of land that looks like it can't bear it anymore is... Uh, rapidly losing legitimacy. Rapidly losing legitimacy. All right, thank you for watching the show.